Hey everyone, today I'm going to tell you how to run a multi-level model focusing on logistic regression. So let's get started. I have this entire thing built into an R Markdown document. So you could go back and look at the code that made this slideshow, as well as run this stuff yourself. And I'll talk at the end where you can find everything. So first thing I wanna do is just show you how I have this set up. Um, which also puts all of the messages from packages at the beginning. So I am using ggplot2 to make some graphs, I'm using dplyr to um, build the tables that those graphs are made on. I'm using rcurl to help me pull the data from GitHub, so you'll also learn how to do that today, and lme4 for the glimmer function to do logistic multi-level models. Last but not least, I have some like, cleanup code that I've used in a lot of videos. This is very similar to the theme black and white that is in ggplot, but it just allows me a little bit more control over what my graphs look like. And I use this for almost all of my publications, and it's covered pretty extensively in the ggplot video if you aren't familiar with that. So this is the setup I have going on, just so you know what packages you'll need. Let me tell you a little bit about the assumptions that I have also in this video. Okay. So this is more of an exercise tutorial video than a uh, lecture. So I am assuming that you know a little bit about logistic regression. So you understand that the outcome needs to be categorical. You understand that the uh, B coefficient values that you get are going to be interpreted differently than regular coefficient values. So you know just a little bit about log already. I also assume that you know just a little bit about multi-level models, that they have steps, and that will work through like a null model and then a random slopes model. And so you understand what random slopes mean and what random intercepts mean uh, and what model comparison is. Okay. I also am gonna assume you know a little bit of R. Okay. More than a little bit, probably a lot of bit of R. If none or one or any of those things aren't true, I have some videos that you can look at here. And I have this link to like a search. So I have a couple lectures on MLM, a workshop, many examples. This should open. Oh, it got mad at me. Well, the links are also included if it won't let you click on them. Up here. Thought that would take me to a browser, but not today. So I have this linked to um, kind of the search feature on my page, and the very first one is the one I would recommend if you aren't familiar with multi-level models. The, this video is for continuous models using in LME package, but the structure of them is very similar. I also have some workshops and some other examples that you can use. Same thing with logistic regression. I have some videos on just basic log regression including binary outcomes, which is what we're going to do today. So binomial model, this is first one here. Uh, a newer one with um, looking at uh, computational linguistics. And then I also have multinomial in case that's what you're interested in. Okay, and this will extend a little bit into multinomial. And then if you don't know R, I actually have a link to our stats tools page. And I would tell you to kind of work through these first several uh, overview videos that explain what is our studio, what are commands, what are object types. However, if you're willing to brave all of that, we can move on to the example. Maybe. All right, so what we're gonna use today is some data for a project that we have that's currently under review, looking at statistical reporting so a colleague of mine and I are just really interested in how people report their analyses and if that has changed any over the years. And so this project actually probably started eight million years ago and then kind of got distracted and we forgot about it. And then the last couple of years we picked this back up and, and extended it and submitted it to a, a journal. So it's under review and you can learn more about it looking at our OSF link here. 
And in this OSF link, there is a link to our GitHub folder where it has just literally everything about the project, including a poster that we gave and a link to the preprint so you can read the paper if you're interested in reporting rates. So spoiler alert, the news is mostly good. <laughs> People do seem to be better at reporting their data, data screening and how they've eliminated participants in their study. So the goal of the analysis was to look at reporting rates at two points in time, one pre you know, science revolution at the moment, um, if we think about the reproducibility crisis, which is a common term used, whether or not you believe there's a crisis, um, that probably started in 2011 is when the alarm bells probably started ringing. So we pulled this data kind of at the beginning of said crisis and it's really hit a fever pitch. And then we pulled a second round of data in 2017 uh, to see if there had been any change. So we've got about five years of people writing about reproducibility, uh, replication, and we're gonna see if that's changed the way people are reporting their analyses. Because the assumption is that papers that have been published in 2011 and 2012, while some people were aware of it, were probably not totally influenced by, um, by some of these seminal papers because it takes a long damn time for journal articles to go from um, even written to published. <laughs> so if we assume that there's some lag there, that those papers are really influenced by the sort of thinking about um, the way we science, but the papers now hopefully are. So that's the main idea. And let's look at that data so that you can see kind of what we've got. So I, using our curl, uh, so get URL, that helps if you are using uh, HTTPS. Um, and then pull the data from GitHub. Now, a quick word of warning if you're going to try to do this on some other GitHub packages. Uh, let's go here. See if we can open this. Once you, this is in the paper folder, once you go to pull a particular data file and you click on it and you're looking at it in github um, <clears throat> and it's apparently too big to be cute don't use this link um, here even though it looks like it takes you to the data use the click on raw here and go to the raw link and that will solve a lot of your problems when trying to pull data from github if you've never done this before I love to call my master data sets master because they're the original unedited data. So I read that in with read.csv and let's just look at what's in it. Right. So what's in it is a reference code. And if you're looking at this data, this is our, our BibTeX link. The um, year of publication, which is not the same thing as the time that we pulled it. So we did this project in two waves, but the publication year, whoops, sorry. Um, is sometimes earlier or later than the wave. So we use the, the final year of publication, the official one, um, which maybe doesn't necessarily represent the time that it first went online, but it's kind of the best we could do. Um, and sometimes to get articles that worked for our project, we had to go back. So even though we started this project in 2011 or 2012, sometimes we had to go back to like 20, 2005 to get articles that met our criteria. Same problem that we had in 2017 when we updated this project. Uh, sometimes we had to work our way backwards. So there may not be full five years between some of these articles. And that just allows us to control the timing of the article a little better. But then we also categorize them by when we, when we ran the analysis. Uh, the type of article, this I'm um, in uh, psychology. So this is cognitive psychology, social, environmental. We created a big old list and pulled uh, 50 articles, I think from both years, uh, 25 from each journal. So we picked the top two journals in each field and pulled articles from those. Uh, author is pretty obvious article type of analysis article is the title of the article type of analysis is like the main analysis that they ran in the study. This is ANOVA, Bayes, uh, structural equation models. And then a bunch of things about the actual data itself. So what was the original sample size? For us today, the key factor here is did they mention outliers or not? 
okay, in any form. So we did a binary outcome of did they mention screening for outliers or not? Okay. If they did screen for outliers, are they people or are they data points? Did they take them out or leave them in? Did they run it with or without? And then just some descriptions of what they were doing, etc. So we had a, a really hard time actually with this project dealing with um, the difference between exclusions, exclusionary criteria that were participant based versus exclu uh, outlier statistical based. So on some studies we did we did they mention outliers right it was was mostly like as they were calling them outliers not when they said we excluded 10 people because they didn't complete the study. So this is truly like they've mentioned this as a like data screening technique and not a, oh, these people, we wanted 35 year olds and we got 37 year olds. So we took them out, that sort of thing. So I'm only going to like work with a little bit of this data, but if you're interested, the data is online and you can uh, run your own models. And we ran other models than this one in our paper. So the general steps to any analysis start with data screening. So we want to make sure the data is accurate. Okay? And we hand entered this, so I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure there are typos because we're only human, but we've checked it a couple times. We want to make sure there's no missing data, that, and if there is, what can we do with it? In this particular analysis, there aren't any missing data points because we um, coded this, hand coded this. Uh, outliers, which is sort of a funny. Uh, question if there's outliers on outliers so there's a star here and then for logistic regression we want to check the assumption of independence which will violate here so I'll use a multi-level model to solve that problem multicollinearity of the independent variables which we won't really have because I only have one independent variable in this study but if I had more than one I'd want to check that and the ratios of the DB and that could potentially be very problematic in our study so starting with accuracy and missing data, one of the first things I did was I just refactored the outlier variable to look nicer. So I just used the factor function and labeled them with like prettier labels, mostly because we were printing pictures, journal style pictures. If I run a summary of that dependent variable, and this is why it's logistic regression, the outcome is binary. So this is a binary logistic regression if we had yes, no, and maybe, that would be multinomial logistic regression. But here the focus is on, did they mention them or not? A very simple question. So across um, many articles, what we found was the majority of the answer is no. So this data screening point allows me to check for accuracy and missing and a preview of the problem of DV ratios. So. In logistic regression, in a perfect world, we're trying to predict an outcome that's likely to be 50-50 because that gives us an equal ratio of the data and we might be able to predict a little bit, have a better understanding of prediction. In the real world, uh, there are prior probabilities of outcomes and we necessarily can't control that. So we wanna make sure that the smaller category is not small and that will depend on what that means for your data, and that the ratio um, between the two categories is not huge. Okay. In this particular case, this is what, four to one almost? Um, so that's a, just a simple calculation. Was it 17, oops, don't type in here. 17, 78 divided by almost 500. So it's three and a half to one. Okay. Once you started getting into like, 9 to 1 and 10 to 1, it becomes very difficult to predict the smaller category, whatever that is. Because at ratios that high, what we'll see is that it mathematically is um, significant, so to speak, uh, to just predict everything in the larger category. So I will get a large percent of this data correct if I just guessed that no one ever mentioned outliers ever. Um, that's not what I want, but um, what we would see is that at very large ratios of the DV, um, predicting the smaller category is very difficult. Okay. Unless you just have really great predictors, which 
the purpose of running these analyses is to know, right? So um, making sure that your smaller category is not too small and the ratio isn't too high. And so I just reran that to talk about DV ratios. If I had more than one IV, I would run a um, correlation table between those continuous IVs to make sure I don't have any multicollinearity. Uh, in this case, I really only have one IV. So I am just kind of skipping that step, but it is important to make sure you don't have multicollinearity of your continuous predictors. But I also wanted to kind of make sure that I didn't have some really uh, low cell values for some of the other variables I'm interested in. So I looked at a contingency table, so um, essentially a, a table of two continuous ver uh, categorical variables against each other, just to make sure there aren't any zeros or really low values in that set of categories. Okay. In this particular analysis, we're not going to use type, but we used it in other analyses, and so I might be interested in making sure that there aren't any zeros effectively. And while some of the ratios aren't great, and clinical, I'm looking at you, um, and sports psych, there aren't any zeros. That's a, that's a, a main key here, uh, or very, very small categories. And I've seen the number five or less, but I really think very small categories depends on the size of the data set, right? So if you have 10 to five, you know, one, that's a very small data set, <laughs> but uh, in general, that would, you know, if you're, I wouldn't say 15 participants is very useful, but that analysis wouldn't trigger any um, problems with like very small category labels. The problem is actually that there's no not enough data overall. So some of these individual categories are not great. But a quick summary, these are the types of data sets that we looked at. So we looked at clinical journals, cognitive journals, counseling, developmental, um, environmental. So some of these are a little are categories that don't pop into your head as the very as the first psych thing that you think of. But we looked up what people get degrees in and um, what were the most popular categories. What is left off here is applied behavior analysis because they do a lot of single subject designs, which don't really work for outliers. Um, quantitative psych because that was mostly people talking about statistics itself. And I forget, there was one more we left off because I just didn't run um, analyses that made sense for outliers. Okay. And overview journals were like big journals that published everything. Okay. And so we can see well, probably okay. And then if we look at the time that we pulled it by mentioning outliers, um, what we can see, first of all, is a good trend where there's more yeses, excellent, but also if there aren't too many small numbers here. Uh, I'm not gonna use this variable, I'm gonna use a more continuous version of this variable because it's more precise, but I would wanna make sure there weren't any zeros uh, overall either. And so it looks like I'm doing okay on this kind of cat uh, DV ratio, potentially. Okay, so the important part is no to yes, making sure there aren't any zeros or very large ratios. So in this data set, I'm also violating the assumption of independence because if we were to go and look at the data, what you see is not only are there multiple types, so I could structure this data by type because we pulled multiple instances of type, right? The journals are repeated. So journal clinical psych for clinical, um, Let's see here. Cognitive psych as one of the big cognitive journals. Oh my gosh, cognitive goes on forever. And journal of experimental psych, learning, memory, and cognition for the other one. Okay. So journal is a, a clustered variable, but then it gets even worse because uh, um, article is also a clustered variable. And what I mean by that is that uh, the journals do repeat, even though I'm not particularly interested in journal. I'm more interested in type. So there's just two types of journals, um, or two uh, examples of journals within each type, just so we had a broader range, so we couldn't blame this on one particular journal. Um, and uh, within that, people ran multiple studies 
And so each study gets its own line. So we've now violated the assumption of independence because each row is not independent of each other because um, journals are repeated, which would probably be okay, except that articles are repeated, which is really not okay. Um, because if one, if in a study, a particular researcher mentions outliers, they usually mention it for all of the studies. And so that creates a, a undue sort of extra in the yes category because it's that person doing it and not that, um, uh, not a re like other people doing it. So we have to control for the fact that um, people are repeated here. And we controlled this by article because it was going to be too difficult basically to list every single author and control by author. Um, <clears throat> so we controlled by the article itself uh, because if I think about my own work, <laughs> I would I would suggest that if you looked across all of my research papers, that sometimes I mention outliers and sometimes I don't, and it's probably a factor of how much control I had and my growth as a as a researcher. So now we have to control for non-independence by using an MLM model. Okay. So I just want to show you what the data looks like because I think it helps contextualize the results. So one thing I did was we calculated a summary of if they mentioned outliers by the time that we pulled it by the type. So this is just giving us like a kind of a percent of each category by um, outlier mention by time point and then I just kind of also mutated that and just changed it into a percent okay this is where dplyr comes in um, so just kind of manipulating this around and there's probably more tidy ways to do this but this is the best I got <laughs> uh, and what we end up with is a table that has um, essentially the percents for uh, yes and no so obviously this is going to add up to 100% for each one and we can kind of look and see um, what's happening within each one. Now, once I start to break them down by the three-way contingency table, we do start to have very small n. Okay. So we'd have to be very careful there in our analyses um, because n is quite small sometimes. So here's forensics for 2012. There's only two studies or two mentions of outliers. It might not be study. Remember, this might be nested by participant, by article. Um, but in general, this table will allow us to visualize the data. So this is why we didn't run this analysis quite this way. It was because um, we could have included all three of these variables in the analysis, but it would have created a problem with low frequency in the DV. So then I subsetted that and looked at only the outlier mentions of yes. So I'm taking this data frame and just pulling all the yeses. From that, I calculated the um, the confidence intervals. Uh, normally, you'd be able to do this with um, maybe uh, the confidence intervals like on a bar graph. But since these are proportions, we had to calculate those based on the formula for confidence interval proportions. And so that's what I'm doing here is calculating the standard error basically of uh, proportion. I created my GG plot by throwing in the data that has just the yeses. On the x-axis, we've got type. On the y-axis, we've got percent. And I told it to color them by year. I added geon point range. What this does is it allows me to calculate the confidence interval. And I just multiplied that by to make a 95% confidence interval, which is 1.96. So the minimum is our percent minus 1.96 times our standard error for that group. Um, uh, and the max is plus 1.96. So that creates these like nice error bars um, with the dot in the middle, X lab, Y lab, uh, cleaning up some themes because otherwise you can't read this at the bottom. So just angling those pictures, those, um, that text, coloring it black and white because journals are boring and they like things that are black and white. And then just a little bit of chopping off the top. Percentages could go to 100, but they don't. So just kind of keeping it readable and my cleanup code. So let's see what happened. In general, 
Do people mention the outliers more in the gray area, which is 2017, than 2012? Looks like the answer is mostly yes. Mostly the um, proportions or percents are higher in 2017 than they are in 2012. Mostly. A few exceptions. A little bit on the methods here. Um, social had its come to Jesus moment, which is what we jokingly called it in the lab, because if we look at the um, <clears throat> the reproducibility project, what that data was run on social psych and cognitive psych papers. And they so show some of the largest changes. Social is very large. Cognitive was already kind of way up here. And this is, I think, ha influenced um, by the fact that a lot of cognitive people run trials. So they run lots and lots of trials and they uh, eliminate um, outlier trials to create a participant average. Um, so things like response latencies, uh, it's a little more common. So I think that's kind of why they started a little higher. Uh, just best guess, given I'm a cognitive psychologist. Uh, and then social clearly had a moment. <laughs> so there are a lot more mentions, but we're still hovering. <laughs> Really about 40% or lower. Okay. So neuro has actually a, a decrease in this. Not sure why. Um, and those are the, the main two notable ones. Now some that aren't really changing, like clinical, um, educational, environmental here, they perfectly overlap. So there's, there's a trend towards higher. But if I wanted to know if that was statistically higher, I'd have to run the analysis. So this help you visualize what we're doing. We're looking at this overall. So we're, we're not going to look at this by field. I'll tell you why in a little bit. Um, but overall, is there a change? So in general, the first step for multi-level models include a null model. I actually, we did not run this in our paper, to be honest, because we knew we wanted to control. So I'm sort of torn on the fact whether or not we need to run a model that does not control for independence in the same way that I feel about uh, factor analysis. So <clears throat> when running some types of factor analysis, one has to think about, do I want to use uh, this type of solution or that type of solution? If you've watched any of my videos on factor analysis, you're like, I, I think I've said like a thousand times, why would you ever run X solution? Because Y solution reduces to X solution if X is true. And that's the same thing I have here is that when you violate the assumption of independence, if a null model with no effects matches a random effects model, uh, then essentially you're just you're controlling for something that maybe you don't need to, but you've at least not violated the assumption of independence anymore. Um, so I, I disagree, I guess, a little bit with um, with folks that say, well, if your random effects don't matter, just run an ANOVA. So uh, I always control for them because I, I treat it as, a, as an analysis control. Um, but we could compare to see if this function actually, is, if controlling for the effects is actually useful. Because okay. that's an interesting question. Is controlling for this effect useful? Well, maybe not, but I'm going to leave it in there because it at least doesn't violate the assumption of independence anymore. So there's lots of ways to feel about this, but this is kind of how mine is. So we actually did not run this model in our in our paper. We just said we went with random effects and moving on. Um, but if you wanted to do it, you cannot use the GLMER function, which I'm going to call Glimmer, um, because that particular function, which is in the LME4 library, requires that you have some sort of random effect. Okay. So one nice thing I think about in LME is it'll let me do some models without random effects, but LME4 or Glimmer definitely won't. So we're going to start with a base R GLM function for general linear model. And we're going to tell it that we want to run a logistic regression by using the um, binomial family. And we're going to link that to the logit function. Okay. And this makes this logistic regression. Remember that when you write code for the, for the, um, formula, it's y is approximated by using the tilde x. In this case, I have no main effects and no random effects. So this is an intercept model. This would essentially be like estimating the difference um, between our two categories. 
and my data set is master. So this is the setup for a binomial logistic regression with no effects, just the intercept. So let's look at what's happening here. So the interesting thing here is actually the intercept itself. Okay. Remember from the data, the overall no's are like 1700 and the yeses are like 450. Okay. With this coefficient here, um, what we're seeing is that um, no comes first. Okay, and what I mean by that is when if I just run a summary, oh goodness, this is why I don't live code. You guys know this. Um, all right, if I run a summary, the first one that comes up is no. So that's what we're gonna call the control group. Okay, it's not really a control group in this scenario, but this is the lower coded group. Okay, so they would be coded zero effectively in contrast coding. Okay, the, the comparison group is yes. Okay. So anytime you have a negative coefficient, what that means is that there it's more likely to be the control group. Because think about this, a negative coefficient means that from the lower coded group, no, to the upper coded group, yes, for, so from zero to one, there's a negative slope. That implies that the <clears throat> zero or the control group has more in it because this is a, essentially a frequency analysis. So it's favored. It's more likely to be no. If we think about our data set, it is definitely more likely to be in the no category. Okay. And that is, you know, significantly different from, from nothing. <laughs> so this is, like, is more likely to be no. All right. We're also going to use these AIC values, but I'll show you how to pull those in a second. That model's only mildly interesting because I already knew that there was more no's than yeses. So let's switch to Glimmer and add a random intercept. So now I'm going to control for the fact that I know that we repeated journals. So journal is a nesting variable. Sometimes you can call this a structured variable. Um, you know, any way that you like to think about the fact that the data has some sort of hi hierarchy. So articles are nested within journal. All right, so now we're switching to GLMER. This is an LME4. So Y is approximated by X. So we still no main effects here, only random effects. Plus, now I didn't actually have to do this one again. This I could have left this first one out. But I always just leave it in like, okay, I'm doing the intercept. It reminds myself, intercept. And then in a minute, I'm going to change it to a real variable. So it doesn't hurt you to leave it in. This code here, if I can get it to highlight doesn't seem to want to let me highlight it. There we go. But here on the end, one, um, this little pipe icon, which for above uh, on a US QWERTY keyboard is above the enter key. So shift backslash um, by journal. So this says, I'm going to estimate a random intercept. So this is the intercept. Um, and that intercept is going to be journal. So I expect the no to yes ratio to vary a lot by journal because some journals, especially in the later years, um, require you to talk about this stuff. So I do expect that change over time to be variable by journal. So each journal is going to start in a different place. So remember, random intercept means that they're, they're sort of, um, in this case, the no category or their y-axis, their y uh, y-intercept varies by this category okay. and it totally does because some journals require it some journals don't so I want to make sure I control for the fact that the data is structured by journal okay. a lot of the rest is the same data equals master family equals binomial link logic that stays the same from GLM we're going to add some gl uh, glimmer controls this is the type of optimizer I have never heard this pronounced out loud. In my head, it's Bobka, but I have no idea how it's actually pronounced um, because that is a type of food. <laughs> and most of my examples, if you've been here a while, are about food. So in my head, that's, that's what it is. <laughs> um, this optimizer control is about the number of, it's not quadrature points, that's IRT. So if you aren't sure, you can do question mark, G-L-M-E-R. All right, it explains this scalar point. Um, so the default is one, which is a Laplace uh, approximation. And 
uh, zero is a little bit faster, but maybe not as quite as optimized. And then you can kind of change these. Uh, you can't use higher than one if you have multiple random effects. And then I left mine at zero because one, it runs faster and um, it solved some problems that we had when we ran into some errors. Um, I would tell you to leave it at one unless you run into an error. So look at model two here. We'll come down and look at the summary. So we're going to use this AIC to compare models. Um, we could also use log likelihood, uh, except that there isn't really a log likelihood for this particular function. I guess we could use the deviances, um, compare those to each other. But AIC is a pretty good model comparison point for these models, especially because they have different variables in them. For our random effects, we can look at how much the intercept varies by journal. And that is not a small amount when you consider the size of the estimate. And I could look at each journal's difference from average, so to speak. And so I probably, it's a good idea to control for journal because the variance here is not basically zero. Um, if the variance was zero, that would imply that the intercepts don't vary by journal. So maybe it's not a useful uh, structured variable. And then there are 27 journals in our example. And you'll see the intercept has changed just a little bit more towards no once we control for journal. Not a huge difference, but a little bit more towards the no category once we control for the variance within journal. Now, I actually, we um, when we first submitted this, we just thought, well, we'll control for journal. And then we got yelled at because we didn't also control for article because it is true that within, uh, if an um, author mentions it once, they're probably going to mention it for all of their studies. Not every study has multiple, not every article has multiple studies. Some articles like in social journals have 87 studies. Social and cognitive are the worst to code because sometimes there's 15 experiments. So also controlling for the sheer differences in the number of data points from each article. Now notice we did not nest this within journal, um, mostly because articles cannot appear in multiple journals. <laughs> so we're controlling for basically the differences in article starting point and the differences in journal starting point. If you try to nest them together because article doesn't appear, you know, articles don't appear in multiple journals, um, this whole thing crashes, which will give you a singular matrix error. Um, and this is the particular model we had to turn um, the optimization function down for. All right, so we're going to use AIC, like I said, here in a minute. Um, nothing too crazy. What we don't want to see when we, uh, if I were concerned about this model crashing, is just some really wild standard errors and uh, variances. Uh, or like very, very large. These are within the realm of I, what I expect. And we do see that the estimate changes a little, again, a little bit more towards no, um, mostly because when you're in the yes category, you're in the yes category. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but the numbers here aren't too, too crazy. So what'll happen when models are really, really poor is uh, often the standard error will be like 700 or 7,000. Okay, same thing happens in structural equation model. So should we control for journal? Probably. There is actually quite a lot of variance um, in journals when you also control for article, and there's a lot of variance there. So that's partially due to the fact that some articles are one data point, some articles are 10 data points, and um, it's not binary, but it's close. If they don't mention it, they don't mention it on any of them, and if they do mention it, they tend to mention it on all of them. So uh, it's not a perfect separation but it's, it's close to one. So we got to control for that. <clears throat> All right, let's compare these. So I'm gonna use AIC for several reasons. One, um, there's no real log likelihood in that first model. Uh, it feels a little weird to compare um, chi-squares for some of these. AIC is a good uh, comparison point when you have models with different predictors in them. And so it's kind of a, a neutral standpoint the problem with the AIC is there's no p-values here. So we can't um, say that this model's significantly better, which I don't know that we want to do anyway, since this whole paper is about statistical reform, but uh, we could see if there are improvements, proving values in the AIC. Okay. 
So AIC values lower is better okay, because they're essentially a measure of deviance. And uh, there are some people who've talked about what ratio you have to have between one to the other. I don't think there's a set consensus on this. You just want lower is better. Okay, so that's something you have to find a way to think about and justify for yourself. But adding that journal as a predictor from model one with nothing to model two with journal as, a as an intercept improves the model a little bit, but adding both of them improves the model a lot. Okay. Now, one thing I could do since articles are nested within journals, essentially controlling for article kind of controls for journal um, because you know, each article can only appear in one journal. So I could try taking out journal and seeing if it's just article that matters. This was a specific reviewer request, so I left them both in. <laughs> Next step might be to add your fixed effects. Okay, fixed effects are the non-random effects. Uh, so I replaced that one that I had before up here with year. Okay. Now year in this case is not binary. So let's go back over here and look at that real quick. Uh, so time pulled is our vi uh, binary, is our binary variable where it's either 2012 or 2017. Year here is not so easy. So what happened was there were papers that did not use participants. And you see this a lot in sports psych because there's a lot of writing about stuff that weren't participant based a lot in methods journals because they were using um simulation studies which there aren't outliers for uh forensics is a little bit more so when when articles talked about um you know theory or they just didn't publish as many um per per, per print publication we had to like keep working our way back. So we pulled the data in 2011, 2012, hoping to hit 2011, 2012, but sometimes we had to go further back. So we go all the way back to 2001. So that to, to suggest that this 2001 is the same as 2012 is probably not accurate. And then you also see that on the other end, let's, let's flip it the other way. Okay, we pulled them in 2017, but they were officially published in 2018. That's because we were mostly doing this work at the end of the fall semester. But then even in our 2017 set, less so, but still a problem. Back up some. We had some that we had to end up going backwards to 2016. So to not misrepresent the time between variables and say this is a five year split, we used year in its continuous format um, to account for those differences. Okay, so year is treated as a continuous variable here, okay, even though there's probably a pretty good chunk in the middle missing. All right, so all I've done here code-wise is change the one out. Let's scroll down and look. Okay. Hopefully uh, not just a whole lot has changed um, in our control variables, or our random intercepts here, and if we go back and look at this model, hmm, no, not so much. Now, the intercept's gonna change quite a bit because the addition of that fixed effect. Okay. Uh, remember that this is a, the, basically a, a kind of a difference between yes and no, and it's still heavily no. <laughs> right. So in general, controlling for everything else, people do not mention outliers. Now year here is our fixed effect. So I wanna know, um, what does this mean, right? So uh, at zero, this would mean that there's no difference between groups okay. uh, and it's positive. So in this case, across years, what we're seeing is a positive trend. So that means from no to yes, we're seeing an increase uh, which means there's an increase in reporting. And, you know, it's, it's not a huge number. Right? It's small. If you wanted this in um, log likelihoods, so you could talk about ratios, like a, a 10 to 1 ratio, right? Um, you could take the exponent of this value. Um, <clears throat> but in this particular case, what I'm essentially saying is that from no to yes, we're seeing this increase in values. And what we did to report this, to make this clearer to folks, is we took each 
type and calculated the um, percent change across time. Um, right. So uh, I can tell that across years, people are increasing their reporting, which was good. That's what we wanted to find. Okay. Controlling for the fact that there are multiple articles and multiple journals. Now, is that significant? Well, yeah, I mean, the variable itself is significant. Is this model better than the previous model? Uh, yeah, a little bit. So my AIC is continuing to decrease by adding that um, effect. So good news, people are increasing their reporting of outliers. Bad news, that number's small, but you know, some wins. Now this last step we also didn't do, but we could add a random slope. And in some of my other videos to talk about, like, I don't know that I'll ever, I've, like, random slopes don't make a whole lot of sense to me. I have since done some studies where they did make some sense. Um, and in this particular case, it might be that within journal, between 2012 and 2017, they updated their statistical standard reporting. And this is true. I'll, there are more than several journals that have changed how they require you report information. Um, they might be using what are called top guidelines, uh, transparency, openness, ah, the P, don't remember it right now. But either way, the, 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 I imagine that the slope for year here might vary by journal. And so what we've already said is that journals are random intercept in the fact that journals are probably going to start in different places, right? So they're going to have different intercept values, which means they have different yes to no ratio. Okay. Now that that increase across year, the slope that we're interested in might vary too by the journal. So it might be, um, I'm gonna pick on um, uh, behavior research methods here because I know that the journal has changed its reporting rates. Um, in, you know, in earlier years, they were like, here, just give us your stuff and the supplementary material, great. And in, in now, when you submit to this particular journal, they ask you, I was like, was this planned? Did you report everything? Have you included a link to where all the stuff is? And we recommend using OSF and this big long list of things that you have to check off. And so that change in reporting might be due to a little bit of the factor of the a randomness in the journal rather than the researchers. So I can add that as a random slope. Now I didn't add this for article because articles are published in one year only. So if you try to do year by article, it does, just doesn't work because the um, articles are not repeated across years. I haven't published this article multiple times, but journals are repeated in both time points essentially. So um, sometimes they make sense, sometimes they don't. To add a random slope, um, meaning that the slopes are all different for each journal. We just replace the one here with it. So we've replaced it in, in the same place. So that's why I left the one in my original code um, to make this obvious because um, that's you would replace the ones if you want a slope. It helps me remember. So let's see if that did anything. Right, let me scroll down. Okay, oh, scientific notation is still on. So let's look at model three here, wait, model four, without some scientific notation, because I find it hard to read. Okay. And let's just make this bigger. All right, so without scientific notation, what we find is that the variance, uh, the variance in the slopes for years by journal is pretty much zero. Okay. So the variance for articles hasn't changed. Now this has decreased the variance for journals intercepts because of the tie to year. But if I'm looking here at year um, variance, it's practically zero. So I would expect that this model uh, is not an improvement over the other model. And we can see that our effects stayed about the same. Year is pretty much 0.11 or 0.12. And what I can do is compare the AICs to each other. So to do that, you do, these are functions that are, I think either in base R or in stats, which comes with base R. You pull the log likelihood and then tell it to calculate AIC. And you can actually see that the AIC increases by adding this year 
has a random slope, which is not good, that implies that the model's actually worse. So I would leave this out. So year is not a random slope. And that means they're all approximately changing about the same once you control for the fact that the data is sort of structured. Okay. All right. And so what's, what's happening is that the changes are all about the same. Now there are two clear outliers <laughs> that have much larger changes. So this is coming back to outliers. So in this particular study, I didn't really screen for outliers because it can, it's either yes or no. It's not really, it can't really be anything else, right? But what I could look for is outliers in the solution, which is particular ones that are much larger than other ones. So we talked about how social and cognitive were quite, quite large. Um, and actually forensics, I think, ends up being one that's kind of large too. It depends on the variance, obviously, within we also could have thought about controlling for type. Okay, and that's why this slide is labeled, why not? The problem is that type is perfectly correlated with journal and with article, because articles are only one type and each journal is only one type. So if we controlled for type, we'd have to like probably ditch one or both of these. Um, so we've kind of got type controlled for by controlling for journal. A journal is more specific that actually has multiple options. So instead what we did in our analysis was then break down each type one at a time and ran essentially this um, this model one at a time to look at the the differences in the in change across time for each one. Okay. Another thing that we could have done was also throw in year and type as fixed effects because what we were really interested in was the change in um, report rates across years for each type. So that's actually a moderation analysis with an interaction between type and year. However, because there are so many different categorical types that became like 18 or 20 predictors, <laughs> when you did year by type and every type against itself, and we weren't really interested if counseling and developmental had different ones, we just wanted to show them. So instead we broke down and ran each model one at a time by, by type and presented that in a table. Um, so we didn't include that as a variable just simply because of how um, complex it made it un unintentionally. When this is really just an exploratory paper looking at do people change and if so, how about how much? All right, so thanks for watching. This is how you would run a multi-level logistic model on binary outcomes using the LME4 package and Glimmer, working through steps. So generally you start with a null model, you add your random intercepts, you add your fixed effects, your random slopes, if interested. Some folks suggest that you should start with the most complex model and work backwards. Sometimes you might end up at different, at, at approximately the same answer, um, or not, I would have ended up with the same answer because I would have tried it with a random slope of year. I would have taken that out and then moved down. Um, so you can work either way. I'm kind of giving you the steps from the Andy Field book, uh, but I know there are plenty of folks who work, you know, most complicated to least complicated. I think as long as you have a set of procedures and rules on which direction you're working, both are fine. Okay. You can check out these materials, meaning these exact slides, this markdown document, on our OSF page and much, much more. So when you go to this OSF page, it is actually everything that's on the YouTube channel and the Stats Tools website. All of this is hanging out in advanced statistics. Our other files, this is stuff that I wouldn't normally teach in class, but if you wanted to teach in class, you could teach in class. And these are both MLM log. So the HTML document, um, which is the slides and the markdown if you want to play with it. The data is included on GitHub and the um, link to that is here at the top so that you can download it if you're interested. Um, but that concludes our multi-level log video and should be posting more updates soon uh, with other requests, including JASP and some updates to structural equation modeling class because packages have changed. So talk to you soon.